Hello and welcome to ML with AP. The topic for today is Naive Base Classifier. Let's learn. What we are going to cover? Naive Base is a probabilistic algorithm. So we'll start with a quick recap of probability. We'll move on to conditional probability, Bayes theorem. After that, we'll learn about Naive Base intuition. And then finally, the maths behind the Naive Base. And if time permits, we'll also go into see other Bayesian classifiers. Let's start. First, a quick recap of probability. I'm sure all of us has studied about probability in our high school, right? Whether it's in 10th or 12th grade. Now, in simple terms, if you take an example of a fair coin and toss it, what is the chance that it will land tails? Or what is the chance that it will land head? If it's a fair coin, it's equally likely. Both the events are equally likely. And that's why we say there is a 50% chance that it will land tails there's a 50% chance that it will land heads, right? We also say sometimes not in terms of percentage, but in terms of fraction, that half is the chance that it will, or half is the probability of tail, half is the probability of heads. We also sometimes tell it in decimal form, like 0.5. All three forms represent the same thing, and which is probability. Another point to note over there is, this is an example of two class problem like there are two outcomes which is possible heads and tails that is not always the case for simplicity let's understand this if the probability of head is half what is the probability of getting tail one minus half which is also half but in a multi-class problem where the outcomes are more than two what will happen let's take an, another example let's see uh, the the weather for tomorrow, it could be sunny, it could be a snowy or a snowfall, or it could be rainfall, right? There are three possibilities. Now, what will be the sum of all three? Let's say there is a 30% chance and there is a 30, another 30% 30 chance for rain, 30% chance for snow and 40% chance for sunny. The sum total of all these outcomes has to be one or 100%. That's one of the fundamental rules of probability, right? So for simplicity's sake, in this particular example, we'll always consider or we'll always try to learn from the two class problem or the binary problems. Okay, let's move on. Let's, let's try to memorize or try to refresh our memory for a few more concepts. Okay, and let's try to understand with this Venn diagrams, two circular Venn diagrams. So there are two classes of people, class A people and class B people. Class A people loves Pongal. Pongal is a South Indian dish. I love Pongal. That is class A. The class B is the people who love Coen Brothers movie. I fall in class B also because I love Coen Brothers movie. Now, will there be people who will love Pongal and will love Coen Brothers movie also? Of course there will be. And what will be that section of people where I also belong? will be this intersection, right? Where these are overlapping, these two concentric circles, or not concentric, there are two circles, red and green, where they are overlapping, that part is the intersection, okay? So one of the fundamental principle of probability is probability of A or B, A or B, whether A happens or B happens. What will be that area? That will be this particular, and over here, this particular area will be equal to probability of A, which is the green circle, probability of B, which is the red circle, minus probability of A intersection B, which is this particular overlap section. Now think intuitively, friends, why there is a minus P A intersection B? The answer is very simple, okay? What we are considering on the left hand side, P A or B, is this area right? And when we are summing P A plus B, we are considering this particular intersection area twice with P A also and with P B also. That's why we are subtracting one of the intersections. And that's, that, that's from graphically, it is very, very clear now, right? That's why we are subtracting it over here. We do not want to double count it or count it two times. Okay. That is one more concept which we'll be needing in uh, later slides. After that, there are two more uh, important concepts, which is mutually exclusive and independent. In case of probability, these are important. 
Let's try to understand that with example. What is independent? Let's say again, like our initial example, we are, we are tossing a coin. Now we toss the coin one time, first time, it landed on head. I will toss the coin second time, saying that hey, the first time it came head, what is the probability that it will come tail this time? What is the probability that the second time it will come tail? Now, does first event has any bearing on second event? No, because it's, it's a fair coin. All the events, I, no matter how many times I toss, the next toss will be independent. The probability of getting head or tail is still half or 50%, right? So in this particular example, these events or the coin tosses are considered to be independent events that the occurrence of past events does not modify the outcome of the future events, right? So they are independent. Okay, let's let me repeat one more time. So the occurrence of past like my first coin toss has no bearing on my second coin toss outcomes, right? So these two coin tosses events are independent. Now what is mutually exclusive? Mutually exclusive means that if A has happened, there is no way B can happen. Okay, it's like um, if it is to say that somebody has gone in north direction, can he simultaneously go in south direction also? No. If somebody has got a baby boy, can he got a baby girl at the same like? In, in the, what is the probability that he will get a baby girl also? It is obviously zero because he has got a baby boy, right? So if one event dictates that the other event will not happen, right? So these are mutually exclusive events. Independent, mut mutually exclusive yeah, or independent. Independent has a direct relation with what we are going to learn in the Bayes theorem. Okay, so please bear that in mind. Let's move on. Can you recall some other laws of probability? One I have listed which is going to come. I would advise you to go and read. One is the complementary rule that if the probability of tail is half, then the probability of head will be one minus half. If the probability of rainy is 30%, the probability of not rainy is 100 minus 30, which is 70%, right? So this is another law of probability. But let's move on. Another concept is con conditional probability. Now, what is conditional probability? As the name suggests, this is based on certain conditions. Let's again try to understand this with a Venn diagram. Now, my this set A is blue colored, okay? Set B is green colored. These A and B are actually events and this yellow color is the intersection of that. Now what does conditional probability say? Conditional probability says what we are, how you have to read this? We have to read P A given B. This pipe sign is read as given B. That means if B has already happened, what is the chance of A happening? This is how the left hand side should be read. Again, let me repeat that. If B has already happened, what is the chance of A happening? Is the P A given B. This is what it means. Okay. Now, if somebody asks you to evaluate P A given B, how will you evaluate? P A given B. That B has already happened over here. Right? B, this green circle or the B circle has already happened. What is the chance that A will happen? Now, think intuitively also and graphically. A the overlap is this yellow region, right? If B has happened, what is the chance that A will happen? Will be this yellow divided by this green area, right? Correct? Right. And that's why the right hand side is represented. P, A intersection B, which is yellow region. P, B, which is the whole green circle, the B circle, right? That's how the probability of conditional probability of P, A given B is calculated. It is P, A intersection B by PB. Okay? Now we know conditional probability. Let's see what is Bayes theorem. Bayes theorem is built on top of conditional probability. Whatever you are seeing on the left hand side, we have already seen in the last slide and that is the conditional probability. We already know intuitively but why conditional probability makes sense or why it is true. Let's try to build on top of it. Now PA given B is PA intersection B by PB. We have already proved that. We have already seen it. What will be the reverse of A? P B given A. 
it will be P, not A intersection B, but B intersection A. But think about it. Does P A intersection B and B intersection A are two different things? They are representing the same yellow area. So whether we are calling it P A intersection B or P B intersection A are the same thing, right? Hence, we can write it as P B intersection A is equal to P A intersection B by P A, conditional probability, right? <coughs> Now let's move these denominators on the left hand side for both the equations, okay? And then we equate it because PA intersection B and PA intersection B. What will happen? PA given B into PB is equal to PA intersection B will be equal to PB given A into PA, right? PB given A into PA, right? Both the equations, the denominator moves to the left hand side and we equate. Hence. P A given B will be equal to P B given A, P A by P B. No issues. Very simple derivation of Bayes theorem from conditional probability. Okay. Now let's move on. Let's try to understand few more terms in context of machine learning. Now Bayes theorem or naive Bayes is a probabilistic model, right? So in, in, in machine learning, these terms are not called A and B. We already know that these are called y and x where x is our feature and y is our output okay so to understand these terms how they are called in machine learning terms in terms of naive Bayes theorem or naive Bayes algorithm we'll try to see it with a simple example let's 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 assume that you're a doctor and you're sitting in your clinic a patient is going to come and the patient has only one feature or one observation or one feature. What is that feature? That feature is X. X is one column only, one feature. And that is the glucose level. What you have to predict? You have to predict that whether the person has diabetes or no diabetes, right? This is the, with this example, we'll try to understand. Let's start with prior. What is prior? PY. Now prior for PY is equal to zero or PY is equal to one. We'll calculate it for both the class. This is a two class problem because either it's diabetes or no diabetes. Diabetes means PY is equal to 1. No diabetes means Y is equal to 0. Two class problems. So we'll calculate the posterior probability for both the classes. Correct? And we'll calculate the prior for both the classes. So let's say the prior for PY is equal to 0. What it will be? It is without even the patient has come walked inside your room or inside your clinic. You have some idea that in the population, in that neighborhood, in that locality, what is the population or how, what is the probability of a person having diabetes that is or no diabetes that is actually prior that is without seeing the evidence what is the evidence evidence is nothing but the feature or the glucose level without seeing the evidence what is the probability that a person has diabetes or no diabetes so py is equal to 0 or py is equal to 1 right that is prior what is evidence the evidence is the feature which we are bringing right the glucose level which the patient is bringing okay what is likelihood the likelihood is simply let's say py is equal to zero given that a person doesn't have diabetes what is the range of or what is the probability of x being or or the glucose level being somewhere okay this is what likelihood is given in the other case, y is equal to 1, given the patient is, given the patient is uh, uh, diabetic, what is the distribution of x? Because x is a continuous variable over here glucose level, so we'll call it distribution level, not the categorical, okay? So what is the distribution or what is the distribution of x? This is what likelihood is. What is posterior? Posterior is prior was py, posterior is, now evidence has been given to me. Now I have to predict that whether y is equal to 0 or y is equal to 1, what I will do as, as, uh, or what you will do as a doctor, what you will do is you will calculate posterior probability for both the scenarios, y is equal to 1, y is equal to 0, given this formula, okay? And whichever posterior probability is higher, you will assign it to that class. So let's say py is equal to 1 uh, given x is higher than py is equal to 0 given x, you will say that the person is diabetic. This is what these terms mean, and this is what the simple example of Bayes theorem also. Okay, let's move on. 
Now we need to calculate for both the scenarios. This is binary classification problem. So y is equal to zero, no diabetes, and y is equal to one diabetes. So we have to calculate for both the scenarios and whichever posterior priority is higher, we assign it to that class. Now try to understand, that was Bayes theorem. Now try to understand what is naive Bayes, where this naive is coming in Bayes theorem. <laughs> naive Bayes is just built on top of Bayes theorem with a slight twist. We'll see what this twist is with this example data set. This is the example data set which I have created. Now there are two features. One is the study time, the second is assignments done. And our predicted is a Aryan binary classification problem, pass and fail. Pass is one, fail is zero, okay? One, zero, zero, one, okay? Now my feature one is a study time. It is a categorical feature. It has three categories, high, low, and medium study time. It, similarly, assignments done is all, some, or none, three categories, right? Now let's see that with this data set, how we can understand naive Bayes. Now with that being, that data set being given, if somebody tomorrow asks you that, hey, can you calculate the probability of a student getting pass if <coughs> The study time is medium and assignment done is sum. Can it be predicted? Of course it can be predicted. Using Bayes theorem, you can predict that. What you will do? You will calculate the what in the red, uh, uh, red rectangle and the green rectangle. The posterior probability for both the scenarios. Y is equal to zero, which is fail. Y is equal to one, which is pass. Both the scenarios, you will calculate the respective posterior probability. Whichever is higher, you will assign it to that class, right? Now let's see how to calculate this. P y is equal to zero, this is prior. Given y is equal to zero, how you will calculate this? How many students failed divided by total number of students? That's what it is without seeing any observation or without seeing any evidence. What is my class prior for zero? That is what, how many students failed by how many pass? Similarly for class prior for y is equal to one, how many pass divided by total number of students? What is my evidence? My evidence is px1 is equal to medium, h2 is equal to. How to calculate that? You try to count how many times x1 is equal to medium, h2 is equal to some observation is occurring divided by total number of observations, right? How to calculate the likelihood? Again, given py is equal to zero, okay, you jot down all the observations where y is equal to zero, given it is zero, how many times x1 is equal to medium and x2 is equal to sum has occurred? You divide it by that and then you will calculate. Similarly, you will calculate this posterior probabilities for both the things. Okay, this is how you calculate. Very simple, right? And you will be able to predict. Now, there are two problems with Bayes theorem and you can see it uh, with this example data set also. Can you guess what are those two problems which I'm talking about? So the hint is zero and two to the power n. Now this hint is a little cryptic. So let me think about for a moment, but pause the video if you want. One of the problem which is very, very evident over here, and if you do the calculation by hand, you'll notice, let's say the likelihood in class zero or the fail over here, if we are calculating, what will happen? Given y is equal to zero. So this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. So my denominator is four, right? Y is equal to four. Given Y is equal to zero, I have to calculate the probability of X1 is equal to medium and X2 is equal to sum. So denominator is four. How many times medium and sum has occurred for X1, X2 is I have to calculate. Medium and sum. Over here, it's not medium sum. Over here, it's not medium sum. Over here, it's not medium sum. Over here, no medium sum. So my numerator will become zero. So zero by four will become zero, right? Zero by four will become zero. That means my posterior probability for y is equal to zero, given x1 medium and x2 sum will always be zero, no matter what, because that, that this thing will always result into zero, right? Now, will that result in a good prediction? No, it will always say the person will pass. But is it always true that the person who has got medium and, and, and has submitted some assignment will always pass? Not necessarily, right? So this is a not a good prediction because it always relies on a very small set. You always have to, and this is only, friends remember, this is only two features. What if there are 50 features? Most of the time in machine learning, we'll deal with 50, 100 features. If there are 50, 100 features, can you imagine that there is a high likelihood, high chance 
that this numerator will keep becoming zero, right? Because you will not get that particular combination, right? That is the first problem. The second problem is also related to the first problem, right? Now, the second problem is, suppose my all the features are categorical with two categories, let's say. In that case also, can you imagine how many combinations can happen like this? If we have like 10 features, let's say, x1 to x10, how many combinations can happen? Given that x1 and x, x1, x2 till x10 has only has two two categories only, it can become two to the power 10, two to the power n, n being the number of features. It's an exponentially large problem, right? It will become, and I'm assuming it's a two class problem, right? Think it about in the, in, in, in terms of uh, multi-class problems, right? or multi-categories, right? Or features are multi-categories. What? So the, the combinations of this particular, or the likelihood to calculate likelihood is becoming exponentially large. So that's the problem with Bayes theorem, okay? For a small data set, perfectly it will make sense, but even that zero problem is there, right? If the occurrence is not there, it will always predict zero. So that is one of the problems, right? Now let's say here comes the naive Bayes. So naive Bayes solves this problem. And how it solves this problem? Let's see. Okay. So what it is trying to do is, uh, it is naive. What does naive mean? Naive means simpleton, right? Uh, someone who is, who is uh, very, very uh, uh, nice and and, and simple and uh, yeah, those those kind of. So I don't know why this term naive came, but. <laughs> Uh, that's the name it has been given, right? So it's a simpleton, okay? So it's a it's a simple take on Bayes theorem. What it is doing is it is making two critical assumptions, or one major assumption actually. Features are independent of each other, okay? What does it mean? Features are that my x1 and x2 are not related to each other. What will happen if they are not related to each other? If they are not related to each other, then by the laws which we have earlier seen, the p x1 medium x2 sum given y is equal to 0 can be written simply as p x1 medium given y is equal to 0 into p x2 is equal to sum given y is equal to 0. We can break it down because now there, these events are independent of each other. We can rewrite our likelihood in form of a multiplicative individual probabilities, right? Individual likelihood. So for x1 is equal to medium, given y is equal to zero, we have to calculate. Similarly, p x2 is equal to some, given y is equal to zero, we have to calculate and we have to keep multiplying. If you have 10 features, something like that, you have to keep multiplying. And that, and this particular arrangement has come because we are assuming that the features are independent of each other. Okay? Now, let's see how it is going to help. Okay? So in our particular data set, if you think, right, over here, <coughs> now we do not have to find that particular combination, which is, which is very rare, right, or has the value of 2 to the power n, right, one of the combination out of 2 to the power n, or it, it may not occur. So those problems have gone away from here, right, because if we have to calculate now that given y is equal to 0, x1 is equal to medium. Now given y is equal to 0, x1 is equal to medium. Okay. In this particular example, that is also not there. But eventually, what, what I'm trying to tell you is that this, the chance of this happening is higher. The chance of this happening is also higher, right? That you will find some observations which is related to this and which is related to this, right? And hence, it is a it is a it is a assumption, simple assumption which we are taking, which is making our life much simpler. Okay, that's why it is called naive. Okay. Now there are a couple of the I said that there are two assumptions. The second is it the features have equal importance. Why we are saying equal importance? That means p x1 is equal to x1 and x2. Both or if there are 10 features, x1 till x10, each of the feature has equal weightage. How it is evident? that there is no weighting term over here, right? Everything is calculated and then multiplied over here, 
okay so features are independent and features are have equal importance right again similar to bayes theorem we'll calculate the posterior probability in similar fashion and whichever is the posterior probability is higher we'll assign it to that class we do couple of more things over here one is we remove the denominator now why do we remove the denominator the denominator is actually a constant if you think right the evidence is a constant okay if the evidence is a constant and all we are trying to figure out is whichever is higher it doesn't matter right if you think it doesn't matter so we remove it over here then what it becomes it, it doesn't become equal it becomes proportional right because we have removed the common denominator from both the side of the equation from both the equation we have removed the common denominator so it instead of equality we have to put proportional but still if our if our job is just to find whichever is higher it will still result in the same inference right that is one thing now the other thing is now if you look at this equation this equation is just a multiplication of your probability terms right and probability lies between 0 and 1 correct then this if there are multiple features this can become very 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 small numbers because if a number is between 0 and 1 and there are 100 different numbers between 0 and 1 and you keep multiplying it will result in a very small number right that's why people take log of this now again similarly how we remove the denominator taking a log also doesn't change anything the log on the left right hand side all we are interested in that whichever is higher compared to the other one right so even if you take log, the value will remain the same. Whichever is higher is higher, right? In absolute terms also, after taking the log also, after removing the denominator also. So we usually take the log of this, right? Clear? Now, still there is one problem. And that problem also came in our data set, right? When I was, let me go back and see over here. So what is, what is that problem? That problem was when I'm trying to identify P X one is equal to me medium given Y is equal to zero, given Y is equal to zero, X one is equal to medium. I was not able to find something. So this, the problem of this zero, what I was earlier telling you, is it still there? Is it still there? My, this term is still zero. So how, how can we overcome that? That is called Laplace smoothing. What they do is, for all such events, they just put one over there. Instead of zero, they replace it with one and they add all the events. They increment everything by one or offset by one. Okay. Let me try to give you an example and this will make more sense. Right. So if this thing is zero, P X one is equal to medium given Y is equal to zero is zero. We'll increment it by one. Similarly, we have to increment everything by one or offset by one. Okay, so probably this was let's say four by five. We have to include this four plus one five. Okay, so we have to in increase everything by one. Okay, all the observations and their individual counts by one. Okay, what will happen then none of these terms will become zero. This is called Laplace smoothing. Okay, and it's a technique which is used in naive base to overcome this zero problem. Clear? Now comes the question that all these things are fine when our features are categorical. But what if my feature is continuous? What will happen? Now, if my features is continuous, let's say over here, if my x1 and x2 are continuous, how will measure these things? How will calculate the uh, posterior, uh, posterior probability, how we'll calculate the likelihoods over here. Now there are two simple solutions for that. One is discretize. You, you make your discretization means you make your continuous data into categorical data and calculate that. That is one way. We'll just see. Or use the probability density function to estimate the likelihood. We'll see both the same. Let's understand what is discretization. Discretization means binning. What is binning? Let's see that if you have a feature which is um, continuous, let's say age, then how can you make a continuous feature into your categorical feature? Simple. Age is a continuous variable. It is between 1 to 100, right? Or, or whatever the higher number is. Now, to make it categorical, we can divide these into buckets. 
or bins as we call it so 0 to 20 young 20 to 30 youth adult and, and similar and similar right we can we can put it into 10 different bins let's say okay and each bin will have then the frequency right so there are 10 people occurring in 30 to 40 there are 30 people occurring in 40 to 50 bracket right and that's the way we can discretize a continuous variable into a categorical variable right clear and once it is converted to categorical variable then in that particular case what we can do is uh, it is converted to categorical and then we can use our base theorem naive base theorem and then we can get the posterior probability the other way to do that is actually to use the probability density function now for continuous variables okay let's try to understand this let's see why given zero what is the probability density of x okay and this is this if you friends if you recall this is nothing but the likelihood right and this is nothing but the likelihood expression right so if you have the data distribution given for both the scenario y is equal to 1 and y is equal to 0 and if you draw in this particular case I'm assuming that they are falling into the normal Gaussian distribution okay so for y is equal to 0 only one feature is there let's say and I'm trying to what I'm trying to do I'm trying to plot it then I will get a nice probability dens density function okay for p y is equal to 1 p x given y is equal to 1 also I will get 1 right now when I get these things what I will do is suppose I have to do a prediction of a new feature what I will do this likelihood or these likelihood terms how I will get what I will do is I will get from this probability density function this probability density function and then I will be able to calculate the likelihood for both the scenarios and once I calculate the likelihood the priors are already categorical we already know prior multiplied by likelihood will be proportional to your proposed posterior probability right this is the way you can calculate most of the time when we are when we are doing this uh, and probably we'll learn this in the subsequent video when we'll be talking about the generative algorithms also most of the time this model when it is learning it is learning these likelihood okay or this data distribution given class 1 given class 0 what is the data distribution this is what we are learning sometime in case of like normal Gaussian distribution we also have we also have the formula either you can take it from tables or from the formula over here what how normal Gaussian distribution is defined it is defined with your mu which is the mean and the standard deviation the spread the standard deviation right so from the data for y is equal to 0 we can gather the information about the mean and the data and the standard deviation similarly for class 1 also we can have the mean and the standard deviation once we have that we can put it in the formula or we can see the tables and all or excel and we can calculate that hey what is the likelihood what is the likelihood for a new a new uh, observation for which I have to predict this is the likelihood this is the likelihood y2 and y1 okay now let's multiply it with sorry let's multiply it with the prior and we'll get our posterior probability proportionate okay simple okay with that being said I think I will close this uh, over here um, I do have a favor to ask you if you have not subscribed to the channel please do so uh, it will mean a lot to me and comment over there if you want to see any other topic being discussed, I will try to make a video out of it. Um, thank you.